From South Carolina Public Radio, this is the South Carolina Lead. I'm your host, Gavin Jackson, and this episode was recorded on May 30th, 2023 from South Carolina Public Radio Studios here in Columbia. Just so you know, some of the information in this podcast may have changed by the time you've heard it. This episode is another from our AT is Busy with Spoleto, so in a bid to make his life easier during the next few weeks, we're sharing some This Week in South Carolina content that I know y'all will like. So this episode is my sit-down interview with former South Carolina Supreme Court Justice Kay Hearn. This interview was taped on May 4th and originally aired on This Week in South Carolina on May 12th, which was the Friday in between the Marathon House abortion debate and before the Senate debate. So you may have seen some clips floating around on social media already. But this is our full interview, which starts off with me talking to Justice Hearn about her background, how she got on the court, what it was like, and her thoughts on the fallout of the 3-2 ruling that found the original six-week abortion ban law unconstitutional on privacy grounds in our state's constitution. So take a listen. Former Justice Kay Hearn, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. So before we talk about more recent rulings and developments on the court, I want to take a look at your career and see how you became a judge, how you became the second woman on the state Supreme Court. So take me back to the law school days. Take, take me back to what drew you to going into the legal profession in the first place. Well, it's really a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I grew up in northwestern Pennsylvania in a little town called Warren with dreams of being a ballerina. And uh, so I was at a crossroads. Should I go to college? Should I try to go to New York and pursue a dancing career? I chose college, and a couple things happened there that kind of changed the direction of my life. Mm-hmm. And uh, one was I, I was asked to attend a conference on women in Washington, D.C., and when I got there, uh, a button was pinned on me that said 5'9". I didn't know what it was. Was it was I the 59th person to register? Was I supposed to sit at table 59? Or God forbid, was this really a math conference and I'd been <laughs> deceived? <laughs> um, but no, I looked around and everybody had a button with 5'9 on it. And it was to drive home the point that at that time, women earned 59 cents for every dollar that a man earned. <sighs> you know, I had led a somewhat sheltered life. I had no idea mm-hmm. that life wasn't fair at that point. And I had a paradigm shift, although I didn't know what it was called then. And um, I never looked at the world quite the same way. So I I sort of changed my course and decided I wanted to do something that I thought would make a difference. Mm -hmm. I I loved history and was majoring in that. So, uh, and you know, growing up, I loved to kill a mockingbird. Who who didn't? So I decided I'd go to law school, which Mm -hmm. wasn't a real typical career choice back then for women, but my parents were all for it, so I went to law school, came down here, saw the University of South Carolina, saw Columbia, just fell in love with Mm -hmm. this town and the university. Still am, it's been a long love affair. (laughs) You know, at that point, there were no women judges. Yeah, I was gonna say, what was it like at USC Law back in the 70s? I mean, going through the school, navigating that at the time. It was exciting, because Mm -hmm. even though there there were only about 20% women, there were 20%. And so we were a bit of a force to be reckoned with. And you could just feel the world changing around you. When I came to law school here, women had just earned the right to serve on juries a couple years before mm-hmm. in South Carolina. So it was, it was sort of a time of change when law firms were considering, well, maybe we do need to hire a woman because now we've got to talk to women jurors, not just men jurors. Mm-hmm. And I did want to do trial work. I, um, I grew up on the stage and singing, dancing, acting, and I, I public speaking. So I didn't want to be a backroom lawyer. During my senior year in law school, well, two things happened. First of all, I guess I should tell you that they were debating the ERA mm-hmm. in the Pretty General much. Assembly. Mm-hmm. So someone, it wasn't my idea, somebody had the idea that some of us should go watch the debate. So. A bunch of us, mostly men, law students, and me went over and sat in the gallery of the State House. And who was who was arguing in favor of the amendment? Jean Hafer Toll. Mm. First time I ever laid eyes on her. Uh, Now, ultimately, uh, the amendment went down to crashing defeat here in South Carolina and nationally. But I came away from that evening just so impressed with this plucky woman legislator from (laughs) Columbia. And had I ever imagined that the two of us would be elected on the same day 
like 25 years later to lead the two highest courts. Well, it's something I never could have thought of because there weren't any women judges. Mm -hmm. So there were no role models in that sense. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but you did get a start there from college up and after graduation. I mean, you kind of had your pick of, of some things, but then a, a pivotal decision got you kind of on a jurist track in a way. Well, the, and, and that decision happened during my final year in law school. I had accepted a job with a firm here in Columbia that I had been clerking with and, and was very happy with that decision. But then I received a letter from a justice on the Supreme Court, Julius B. Ness from Bamberg, whose nickname was Bubba. And that year, instead of taking applications for law clerks, he asked the dean of the law school, uh, a great man named Harry Lightsey, to recommend five students to him. I don't know why, but I was one of the five, fortunately for me. And so I walked into the interview. Even though I already had a job, I'd never met a Supreme Court justice. My parents didn't go to college. Mm -hmm. I was going to be the first lawyer in the family, so I wanted to meet a Supreme Court justice, especially one named Bubba. I'm glad I get to meet one, but continue on. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to the interview. I walked into the Supreme Court in, ironically, the same office that was to become mine years later. <laughs> and he stood up and shook hands and smiled. And I thought, oh, this is good. He seems like a regular guy. But the first words out of his mouth were, I have a lot of problems with you. And I'm thinking, my goodness, <laughs> he just met me. He's the one who invited me to come interview. And I said, sir? And he said, well, first of all, you're a girl. And you know, I don't know, I just automatically said, well, you just gonna have to talk to God about that. He laughed, I laughed, and I got the job. Mm -hmm. So that changed everything in my life. Mm -hmm. And I became so close to him. I moved to Bamberg. Uh, he said, well, you're gonna have to move to Bamberg. Well, I'd never been to Bamberg. But I said, sure, yeah. because I wanted the job. And uh, he became my teacher, my mentor, my friend. So close. I'm still mm -hmm. very close to his whole family. And then tell us how you kind of got to that point then, got that to that office eventually. How did you work your way up from being a clerk to then becoming a Supreme Court justice? Well, when I left Justice Ness, I just took the best job offer I had, which happened to be in Horry County. And it was a firm of trial lawyers and the senior partner was a former senator of some 20 years, James P. Stevens. <laughs> he was also a wonderful mentor to me. And I, you know, as I look back, I realize that you don't have to have mentors that look just like you. I had two much older men who were my mentors, but mm. they were great. And he was encouraging that I should consider at some point running for a judgeship, and of course, so was Judge Ness. Gradually, women started entering the judiciary, and after practicing law for about six years, there was a vacancy in the 15th Circuit, Horry County, for family court judge. So I was encouraged to run for it. I did, mm -hmm. and I won. And back then, in 1986, I became the third woman judge out of around 100 state court judges. Wow. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of unexpected when people would see you on the bench, right? Oh, yeah. And, and I looked real young. <laughs> Those were the days, right? Um, I, didn't look what I didn't look like the judges judge. looked. Yeah. And, and I, I was often confused as a law clerk, mm -hmm. especially not, not in my home circuit, but when I traveled mm -hmm. to other circuits. And that and, propelled you to the Court of Appeals. Yes, I, I, I was on the family court bench for almost 10 years, and I really loved it. But, you know, when you start out at age 36, you know, you're kind of thinking, well, do I really want to keep doing this for the rest of my, my working years? So I had the opportunity. I missed the appellate work I had done with Justice Ness. So I had the opportunity to run for the Court of Appeals. And, you know, it was just a, a different time. I mean, I think people were excited about women entering the profession. And I was elected immediately after in the very next election after the General Assembly had elected Carol Connor, mm. the first woman the appellate court. judge mm -hmm. in the state. You know, uh, well, there was Jean Toll too, of course, but the first woman on the Court of Appeals was Carol Connor. Mm -hmm. And then the next go around, the next time there was a vacancy, I ran and I was elected. And at that time, the Court of Appeals had six members. It was oh, such a wonderful court. And I was there for 15 years. Mm -hmm and served as chief judge for the last 10. 
and that was the election I was talking about with Jean Toll. On the same day in June 1999, the two of us were elected to lead the two highest courts. It was such a great day for women mm -hmm. in South Carolina. And when you have that, I mean, what, what are your thoughts in terms of what that meant, what that signaled to uh, maybe the state, maybe to women in the legal field? I thought it signaled a new, a new era, and it did at the time. I mean, unfortunately, now I think we're backtracking a little bit. We're going backwards. But I, I'm an optimist at heart, and I believe that's going to change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because then you became the last woman on the Supreme Court after Jean Toll left in 2015. Yes, all of a, there were two of us, and then she had to retire, <laughs> mm -hmm. and then it was just the boys and me. <laughs> and uh, one of my former law clerks jokingly refers to me as their Wendy. Mm. And they were the lost boys. <laughs> it's not true at all. They're not lost, but but I was helpful in some ways yeah. to them. And um, I'm I'm kind of lost without them now. Mm -hmm. How did that change deliberations? I mean, if you can peel back the curtain a little bit and tell us, you know, how those kind of come about and what it was like when you had someone like Gene Toll, Chief Justice mm -hmm. Toll, in the court, and then just you and and maybe how things progressed to this point. You know, it is different being the only woman. It is. Uh, when I entered, when I became uh, a justice on the court. Jean Toll was the chief justice. And, and we became very close. A lot of people assume she was a mentor of mine. Not really, I was actually a judge before she was. Mm -hmm. But she became a mentor <coughs> as my chief justice, of course, as my leader. And we used to joke that we were the bookends of the court. You know, we'd keep those men together, you know. And it was a different dynamic when she left. Mm -hmm. And I had to be a little more mindful of, of, of women's perspectives on things. I didn't really have to think that much about it before because there were two of us. Mm -hmm. But then it was on my shoulders. And I always found my colleagues, when I would say, now wait a minute, we're reappointing 40 lawyers to a board here and only four of them are women. I, in good conscience, I can't do that. Yeah. We are almost 40% of the bar. And, and they would realize I, that quickly, uh, there was never any pushback, mm -hmm. but sometimes it takes, and I think that's what's, that's why diversity on a court is important. It takes having someone in that position to think about things like that. Yeah, especially when you're talking about the, the, the diversity of the bar, then you look at the diversity of our state, which is 51% female too. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you should really, you know, more, you know, more than half that court should be <laughs> female in a sense. Well, I mean, does it have to be? Or? But, well, and you know, I think it, 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 at some point perhaps could be, mm -hmm. but it's not just every woman that can become a judge. You have to go to law school first. Mm -hmm. And it's only been in about the last 10 years that law schools have been 50-50, mm -hmm. pretty close to it. Charleston, I believe, is 60, 40 mm -hmm. women at this point. So over time, you know, that's changed. When I went, it was 20%. So percentages have gone up. I think we're getting close to being 40% of the bar. Okay. And that's way past critical mass. So mm -hmm. we are a force. And I do worry when those women lawyers argue their cases <coughs> before the court that they now look up and they see five men. Mm -hmm. um, it can be, it, it's never been intimidating to me. I've always loved men. And I was one of those tomboys growing up. I didn't play with dolls. I was out hitting the baseball or something. But it can be intimidating. Well, I think you, going before the Supreme Court by itself is intimidating. Is intimidating. But I'm, not a, I'm not a lawyer. But yeah, I mean, you guys are always jumping on these lawyers. They can't even finish uh, a complete thought. You know, I you're, mean. So, you're so right on that. <laughs> There's a saying that says appellate judges are a lot like dogs. Uh, individually, they can be agreeable, even nice. But beware when they travel in packs. Yeah. And we are a pack up there. There are five of us. So, I yeah. think I'd lose my cool. <laughs> <laughs> it is intimidating. Yeah. And, and, you know, sometimes it's nice to look up on that bench and see someone that looks like you. Mm -hmm. And now your thoughts. I mean, after 35 years, we, we're the only court in the country now without a, a female justice on the Supreme Court. You said that might change soon. Uh, we'll see some retirements coming up. But uh, your replacement was a man, even though the two women were running for that seat. What were your thoughts on that race? Well... You know, Gary Hill is a wonderful judge. He writes, as a just judge on the Court of Appeals, he, he, he authored some of the most academic opinions I've ever read. He is, he is a great candidate, and he is very deserving of being on the Supreme Court. Having said that, the two women who were running were equally deserving, and perhaps more so in that they had been on the bench longer. 
Judge Condoris particularly had, had really paid her dues and Judge McDonald had. So it was disappointing. Not that I'm happy for Gary Hill mm -hmm. and, and he will be an excellent jurist, but I, I wish the General Assembly had thought about how important it is to have diversity on the court because all three of them were very, very qualified. Do you all think, and that was your understanding, pretty much reactionary to that decision dealing with abortion earlier in January? Well, you know, I think it was a perfect storm. I think there were a lot of things going on. Mm -hmm. uh, in the last uh, legislative election, many, many more Republicans were elected, and some of them were extremely conservative mm -hmm. on many issues. And that changed the face of the General Assembly a good little bit. I'm sure that our Planned Parenthood decision didn't help, but you know, yes, I authored the lead opinion, but there were two male justices who agreed with me. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah. I really regret that that opinion would have had any impact on this election, but I do think it, it played into it, mm -hmm. sadly. And you stand by it. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. I mean, if you are going to pass a law, a statute dealing with, with abortion, you need to give women enough time to know that they're pregnant. And six weeks is a joke, as every woman, every woman knows. Mm -hmm. Maybe some men don't know that, but every woman knows that. And that was the law that was passed in 2021. Then that was in the federal courts until the decision with Roe got overturned. Um, then another lawsuit kicked it to the state Supreme Court. I want to talk to you about abortion further. And when the day that Roe was repealed, did you think in the first place that that was a good decision by the U.S. Supreme Court when it came to Roe? And what were your thoughts when it did get repealed? Well, you know, I grew up with Roe. I don't know if I had been authoring Roe that I would have based it on a right to privacy since there is no right to privacy in the mm -hmm. U.S. Constitution. But I do believe very strongly in a woman having the right to make medical decisions about her own body. We in South Carolina have a provision in our Constitution that specifically gives our citizens a right to privacy. That provision has been interpreted by our Supreme Court to apply to a death row inmate who did not want to be medicated before he was executed. Mm -hmm. And as I said in my opinion, it's just inconceivable to me that a convicted murderer would have a greater right to privacy over medical decisions of his body than a woman. So because we had that right to privacy, we were able to reach a different decision than the Dobbs Court did. I thought Chief Justice Roberts' opinion was very reasonable. I certainly believe in reasonable restrictions on abortion. Mm. I don't really want to discuss that decision too much because I think <clears throat> my decision speaks for itself mm -hmm. and I don't really want to editorialize on it. But you all did write separate opinions too, which is kind of rare. Is that just really a way to show that you guys aren't legislating from the bench, which I'm sure has always been a worry mm -hmm. from folks across the street from the state house in the Supreme Court, I should say? Mm -hmm. You know, I think it was, it was also a very important issue that we all felt strongly about. Uh, I felt strongly that the right to privacy resolved that statute. Now, if the statute had been 12 weeks, 15 weeks, I may well have felt differently. Chief Justice Beatty felt strongly that there were other constitutional implications like equal protection. I, I don't necessarily disagree with his opinion, but I didn't think we needed to go there. Mm -hmm. I thought the right to privacy was strong enough. So. Obviously, there was a lot of blowback from that opinion, too. Ac across the street from the state house and the Supreme Court, like I said, um, the House and the Senate, the governor's office, they were all kind of spun up about that. That was probably expected. Uh, was there any kind of... It wasn't expected that the no. governor would mention it in, in the of state state. of the state. Mm -hmm. No, that was not expected. So I guess let's talk about unexpected uh, fallout from that decision. I mean, what kind of blowback did you see? Did you see support? What was the reaction that you were I hearing? saw so much support. It was amazing. I got letters from strangers all over the state, many from OBGYNs mm -hmm. thanking me. I walked into a restaurant in my hometown and people stood up and clapped. I don't think the General Assembly has a clue how the majority of people in the state really feel on mm -hmm. abortion, and I hope they'll figure it out. And we've seen polling that shows that there's support for abortions with exceptions up to a certain time. Yes. And, um, 
we've talked to people about that too, and gerrymandering plays a little bit of a role in how it that does. plays out. It does. <laughs> Sadly, it does. And then, you know, the other thing that was so interesting, I received quite a few messages from <coughs> wives of legislators, mm. legislators who unfortunately and very sadly felt they had to vote a certain way on that act. I don't think in their heart they believed it. Their wives certainly didn't mm. because they applauded my decision. So I did not, you know, I, I was shocked when the governor as a litigant in a case that was still pending before us and certainly as a lawyer and a former U.S. attorney, yeah. he knew better. I was shocked uh, when he blasted the court. I've been going to those uh, state of the state addresses uh, since 1995, and it's always been so cordial. You know, we have so much respect for the General Assembly on the court and so much respect for the governor, and it was very disheartening to see that that was not reciprocated. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of applause there too, I'm sure from the members in the, the House and the Senate that were there for that General Assembly meeting for well, the governor. some state. of them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, because then there's also talk about reforms and uh, there's not much support when it comes to, you know, folks ceding their power when it comes to the House and the Senate choosing these justices, choosing these judges, and giving some of that power to the governor. I mean, what, do you have any thoughts on judicial oh, reforms? Do I we do. need to change how we pick judges? Absolutely in not. Okay. When I was chief judge of the Court of Appeals, I rose through the ranks in the national uh, organization of chief judges. It's called the National Conference of, of Chief Judges. And I ended up being president of that group. And I, I was very close friends with chief judges from all over the country. And I spoke with many of them about their systems of election. Of course, public election is the absolute worst. I remember a conversation I had with one of my friends in Texas who had to raise several million dollars to obtain a position that at that time paid about 100000 And I said to him, well, who gives you this money? And he said, well, big corporations, law firms. I'm like, well, isn't that a nightmare? Because you have to recuse yourself then when those lawyers or those corporations come in front of you. And he looked at me like I was nuts. He said, of course I don't. That's why they're giving me money. I think that would be a terrible, terrible system, terrible for judicial independence. Mm -hmm. Gubernatorial appointment is fraught with so many political uh, considerations that I don't favor that. I, I'm not saying that we have the best system in the world, but I think it's the best of the ones I know. We do have several merit-based steps. We have mm -hmm. a citizens committee that screens you. We have a bar committee that's pretty powerful, and they send out surveys, and the General Assembly, they, they listen to, to those results. And then we have the ultimate, um, uh, we give testimony, the candidates in front of the Judicial Merit Selection Commission. Mm -hmm. There was a period of time for quite a few years where there were no women on that commission. And I made a lot of noise about that. And I encouraged women lawyers to make a lot of noise about that. Fortunately, that's changed. There still are not enough women on that. Mm -hmm. should be should be 50-50 in my view, yeah. but it's not. So I, do I think there could be some improvements? Yes, but um, we have an amazing group of judges in this state. We really do. They're hardworking, they're personable. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they handle more cases than most judges in other states. And I'm, I'm very proud to have worked shoulder to shoulder with them. And I, I, I think our system of election is a good one. And Justice Hearn, with less than a minute left, just um, where do you go from here at this point in your career now? And uh, maybe some advice for folks who might want to jump into the legal field. Mm, gosh. Well, I ultimately plan when I'm finished, I'm still serving as an acting justice because mm -hmm. there's some opinions circulating that I sat on. Uh, I am sitting with the court for May term for mm -hmm. a couple days. I'm going to do that for a few more months, but and, and that's very typical. Most justices who retire do that. Um, and then I intend to go into private practice and do appellate work because that's really the only thing I think I'm capable of doing. <laughs> I'll probably be more involved with my church, more mm -hmm. involved with our community theater group, which is also a love of mine. My advice to anyone thinking about law is go for it. It is a wonderful profession. So many doors are open to you. You don't have to be a trial lawyer. You could be a mm -hmm. transactional lawyer. You can use your law degree in business. It is a great profession for everyone, and I'm very proud to have been part of it. 
former state Supreme Court Justice Kay Hearn, thank you so much for talking with us and sharing your insight. Oh, absolutely, my pleasure. Thank you. You can find that entire interview on youtube.com slash South Carolina ETV, where a lot of great content lives. And again, folks, thanks for listening to the pod. You can always show us your appreciation by leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or a voicemail at 803-563-7169. You can also stay up to date with the latest news on sceTV.org and SouthCarolinaPublicRadio.org. And don't forget to support your local newspapers. For the South Carolina lead, I'm Gavin Jackson. Be well, South Carolina. Right now? (laughs) <laughs> hey, folks, <laughs> it's me.